So distraction is the reliable way to feel good that you have learned from real experience. So it's a real physical pathway in your brain. And it really works because once you go to your distraction, you stop that whole negative thought loop. How do I avoid it? How do you avoid it? <laughs> so the first step. Welcome back to another episode of the Being Yourself Show, where world's renowned thought leaders and best-selling authors share their wisdom and insight with you so that you can achieve your goals and be more productive and a better version of yourself. If you're new to this channel or have not yet done so, then you may consider subscribing. I'm your host, Ajay Mathur, and my guest today is somebody who has done intense research into your brain. She is a best-selling author of two books, which talks all about the hormonal changes that are happening up here when you are trying to be happy but struggling how to. Her work has been translated into more, more than seven languages, and she has been featured by Forbes, NPR, Wall Street Journal, and, and you name it, really, almost everywhere. She's everywhere. So let's welcome the best-selling author of these two books, Loretta Bruning. Bruning, is it correct, Loretta? Yes, yes. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, so, Loretta, first of all, before we get into the brain and the intricacies happening behind, I wanted to ask you, what is your inspiration to do so much of research in this particular area? Well, like most people, I have my own unhappiness. And when I was young, I was surrounded by a lot of unhappiness. So I think I was always very motivated to understand, you know, what is everybody so upset about? Because uh, sometimes people have simple explanations. But for me, it was really a mystery. I couldn't really, you know, understand why my mother was always so upset. So I was happy when I first discovered academic psychology when I was young. But as the years went by, I kept feeling that the academic model of human emotions didn't work for me. And especially as I raised children and had thousands of students and saw, frankly, like the children of psychology professors, <laughs> you know, I, I said, mm, this is not the whole story. Something else is going on. And I just kept reading and reading. And I have to say that David Attenborough's nature videos also had a big impact on me. I love David Attenborough, and I checked one of the uh, documentary about life. Is it life? Yes. Uh, exactly. The one you mentioned at the end of yes. your book. So you, yes. uh, Loretta's book, if you read, guys, there is a big list of things that you can refer, and one of those is uh, uh, she's mentioned some movies that you can watch and uh, David Atten Attenborough's documentary series. I think it's available on BBC, um, just in case people want to check it. It's all about how do people learn from, from their hormones <laughs> i don't know yeah, how, do, how yeah. do people dominate how do people be happy how do people do certain things what is the science behind it and loretta has spoken a lot about these five uh, happy hormones i would say dopamine oxytocin endorphin and serotonin but i wanted to focus on one particular subject which is about you know how to be more productive she's told enough about how to be happy in the books and then i recommend everybody to you know get a copy of any of these books she's written for them uh, and that's full of knowledge full of inspiration but Lauren I wanted to know from you can you manipulate hormones to be more productive sure well it's not the simple kind of manipulation that people are hoping for like just have a spoonful of this or a pill of that <laughs> so I'm going to get down to the reality of it and then each individual can decide how to incorporate that in their life because there's trade-offs so the bottom line is that the brain is focused on rewards and threats. So we all have a limited amount of energy and our brain is designed to constantly make decisions about where to invest it. And we're going to invest it where we anticipate the highest reward and the least threat. So how do we know what the rewards and threats are? Well, first, there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, but the way we decide is really with neural pathways built from past rewards and past threats. Now, they are obviously not perfect predictors of future circumstances, which is why that's why we're always second guessing ourselves, but then going back to our old patterns. So 
whatever rewarded me in my past, I'm biased to expect rewards in that direction. Whatever rewarded you in your past, you're biased to expect rewards in that direction. But then there's the next complication. Our brain habituates to rewards it already has. So a simple example of that is if I walk into my favorite chocolate shop in London and I smell this fabulous chocolate smell and it's like, wow, I'm so happy for five minutes. And then my brain habituates to that and I don't even notice that. Mm -hmm. So whatever made you have this fabulous rewarded feeling in your past, so you wanna go back to that, but then it doesn't work as well for you anymore, but then you don't really know what else will work. So you're like, oh, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? So, so that's sort of a quick introduction to some of the problems of what should I be working on and why is it not seeming so exciting? So even if you have, uh, let's say you've understood the patterns, of course, the past performance is not the indicator of future returns, like the stock market people say. And you mentioned it very well that you kind of uh, understand the patterns. But sometimes it happens that even though you know that, let's take, uh, if you work for one hour every day in the gym, then you will have a good physique in six months. Let's take this as an example. I know it. Everybody knows it. But still, something happens and people, I mean, with the New Year's resolutions, now we are in December, a lot of people will be making resolutions about the gym and health. Every year that happens, lots of gym memberships, and they last only for one month or two. They lose that motivation. What, what happens? I mean, you know, obviously everybody knows the rewards of it, but we still can't continue. Sure. Very good point. So I'll give you an explanation for that, and then I'll use a similar example from finance because, you know, we've all been nagged so much about going to the gym. So <laughs> let's apply it to something else. So I think the bottom line is what is the reward of going to the gym? Well, you might say having a good physique, but then what? So what will change in my life if I have a good body? Will people be nicer to me? I don't know. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So um, maybe you think if I have a good body, then I'll have to participate in, let's just be crass and call it a social marketplace that we find unappealing. So so in your brain, you're like, uh, is that really a reward? I don't know. Or maybe you think once I have a, a good appearance, then I will go out and date, but then I might still be rejected. Uh, or when I have a choice between going to the gym or doing something fun, I think, why should I go to the gym just to please a judgmental person that only likes me because I have a good body? So all of these kind of thought processes get in the way of this perception of reward, which is highly subjective. So you have many different feelings about what is really rewarding. Now, I worked in the finance industry um, after my first uh, round of graduate school. And even though I was uh, very motivated before that, I have to tell you that I literally fell asleep at my desk once because I was so bored. <laughs> so why is that? Because the perception of reward in my mind just wasn't high enough. So why was that? Well, it's very individual. Our perception of reward, the expectation of reward is a real physical pathway built by my past dopamine. So for me to have the dopamine of, wow, I'm going to do a good job in this finance company and I'm going to get big rewards. I didn't have that because I had never been in a world where I got rewards by getting approval from others in that way. So I didn't really trust that if I worked hard that I would get a reward, nor was that reward particularly meaningful to me. So that's why I said it's very individual. And once you understand your own dopamine circuits, then you have a decision to make. Either I'm gonna build new dopamine circuits to get excited about this niche I'm in, or I have to find a niche that fits my dopamine circuits better. Okay, so now that you have uh called it out. Let's, for the people who are not really clear about the differences of these hormones, could you please give us uh, the sort of what dopamine or oxytocin or endorphin 
or serotonin are, what are their differences, and what exactly the what part of life uh, each are related to, just so that you know people can can be connected more with us when they are listening to the confirmation conversation because we are going to talk about hormones a lot. Great. So dopamine is that anticipation of reward that gets you feeling excited. It's been a lot in the news lately. We hear about too much of it and too little of it and everybody blaming their dopamine on something outside them. So that's why I always go back to the animal brain. We've inherited these chemicals from animals. What turns them on in animals? So imagine you're a monkey waking up in the morning and you have no refrigerator or supermarket, so you have to find food. So you look around, you see food in the distance and that triggers your dopamine. And you get the good feeling of, wow, I can meet my needs now. So you take a step toward that banana and then each step closer triggers more dopamine. So this is the good feeling we're always looking for. But in the modern world, we get our bananas so easily that in order to get excited, it takes something new. So in the state of nature where there was so much hunger, any food you found was a new pleasure. But in the modern world, it's more of a struggle to find new pleasures, which is why people struggle with it and why we repeat things that gave us pleasure in the past because neurons connect when your dopamine flows. So we always have the illusion that we're gonna get it from whatever triggered it in our own past. That's very complicated. We could talk more about that later. So let's go on. So oxytocin is the chemical that people often call the love chemical or the bonding hormone. And like all of these, it's a gross oversimplification that makes it sound like animals are in this herd and they all love each other and support each other all the time, which is so untrue. Uh, so animals have a lot of conflict and they pre prefer to spread out. But if they spread out too much, then the isolated one is the first one that gets picked off by predators. Yeah. So they're always making the uncomfortable trade-off of how much do I follow the herd where I end up eating grass that has been peed on, which they really hate, or how much do I go off on my own and then my predator alarm goes off? So they're making that decision with each step. And you could see how we do that in our daily lives. Like I could follow the herd and then I feel more protected, but then I'm frustrated because I'm missing out on greener pasture. But then when I go out to greener pasture, I feel isolated and threatened. So we're always looking to get both. And what can I do to get that bonded feeling? Then, then they get on your nerves when you have a group. So then how can I get away from them? But then you get away from them. and then you're... So that's life again. So that's why I'm saying there's no easy answers. So is so, it like, sorry, so is it oxytocin which keeps them together or? Yes, oxytocin is the good feeling that you get when you're together. Yeah. Um, but then once you're together, then you already have that. So then you get frustrated because you notice the the downside of being together, which right. is um, more conflict. And so you have incentive to go off on your own because that gets you more dopamine of of finding your oh, own grass. But then good. once you're too isolated, then you realize you smell a predator, you're not safe. So you go back to the herd and the herd triggers your oxytocin, but not because they're going to lay down their life for you, but it's because you're hiding behind them so that they get eaten, which is not the altruistic illusion that you get. And that's why I like David Attenborough because he's rather honest about this. That's interesting. I didn't think about it like that. I'm going to watch that documentary now. Well, it's 10 part series and he has like, you know, an hour on reptiles, yeah. an hour on da, 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 da. So there's the hour on herd animals, which is what I've explained. And then an hour on monkeys, they have a bigger brain and their troops have even more like a part together, a part together kind of behavior. And then an hour on apes, which is even more complex. Okay, so dopamine and oxytocin, we covered two more. So serotonin. So people hear about this in the context of antidepressants, but in the animal world, it's very complicated and yet very simple. So for a whole century, it's been known that animals are competitive and mammals are hierarchical in their groups. They have social dominance hierarchies so that they avoid conflict with stronger individuals by pulling back. And so stronger individuals get more food and mating opportunities and you only assert yourself 
when you perceive that you are the stronger individuals. Otherwise, otherwise you get bitten. If I go for a banana, when you're close to me, if you're bigger, you're going to bite me. And I don't want to get bitten, but I need a banana. So when I compare myself to others all the time, and when I see that I'm stronger, serotonin triggers a feeling that is strong, confident, proud is what we would call it in human terms, but it tells me that I'm in the one-up position, so it's safe to assert myself. And who doesn't like that feeling? So it's nice, we would like to have it all the time, but it's not designed to be on all the time. In the animal world, it only goes on in that moment when you see that you're in the one up position. Because if, if you had it when you were in the one down position, you would act like a jerk and you would get kicked by stronger individuals and not survive. So when you're drunk, you feel more confident. That means you're high on serotonin. Is that correct? No? No, I didn't say drunk. I said uh, you would- No, I'm just asking. Jerk. Oh, no, 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 oh. no. I'm asking when you said that serotonin is kind of uh, helps you feeling strong and confident. So when oh. people are under the influence of alcohol, for example, they behave those kind of, uh, they show those. Oh, kind of I see. Okay, good, good. Okay. So um, in the animal world, there's a lot of self-restraint. Mm. So there's, you see like a big dog and a small dog and the small dog restrains itself. The small monkey restrains drains itself to not get bitten. So alcohol lowers your self-restraint. Okay. Yeah. But not everyone has that response because some people, they always see themselves as the small dog and the small monkey. And I'm never going to get the banana and everyone is bigger than me. And I'm always going to lose. And when they drink alcohol, they feel that because they, that's their default wiring. And so when they let go of their self-restraint, they have 100% self-pity rather than 100% self-confidence. So it's whatever your learned default position is. Okay. Endorphin, finally. Okay. Endorphin is chemically the same as opioid, and the word means endogenous morphine. And it is triggered by real physical pain and it masks pain with a euphoric feeling so that in the animal world, if your flesh is ripped open by a predator, you could still run to save your life. Or if you break a bone, you could still call for help. And then after a few minutes, the endorphin wears off and you feel the pain because you need awareness of pain to protect your injuries. So we are not meant to have endorphin all the time. And we are not meant to inflict pain on ourselves to have it. So I'm very opposed to this confusion about um, exercising to the point of pain to bring happiness. I think it's, it's very short-sighted and misguided and caused by a a lack of understanding that we do need to seek dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin, but we're not meant to seek endorphin. We're just meant to have it for emergencies. But I explain in my book that laughing triggers a little bit so we can get a little from laughing and then you could always get more from laughing more, but not to inflict pain on yourself. Is it something similar to adrenaline rush? Oh, good question. No, adrenaline is, so there's unhappy chemicals and adrenaline is sort of like in between. So if I explain it, um, let's say if I'm in a car and I push on the gas, that's adrenaline. But whether I go forward or backwards depends on what gear I'm in. So happy is forward gear. Threat is reverse gear and adrenaline is just to go forward faster or to go reverse faster. So adrenaline is the awareness, like this is very urgent. This is very urgent, but it's released both for good urgent and bad urgent. And so we're challenged to interpret our own adrenaline feelings. And that's why we're so individual on that. And some people love danger. Um, and other people hate to put themselves like skiing or on a Ferris wheel or a horror movie. Okay. So we all have different uh, adrenaline circuits built from our past experience, including our skills for our human cortex to interpret the chemical. Okay. So 
to summarize for everybody, oxytocin is a love and bonding hormone. Serotonin is feeling strong and confident. Endorphin is about triggered from pain, but it's kind of euphoric feeling. Don't trigger pain. And uh, and uh, what is that? Serotonin, which, sorry, what was the last one? Oh, oxytocin, oh. dopamine, dopamine, which, that was the reward hormone. So this is about uh, being happy in using your hormones. I mean, knowledge of your hormones. You're not really uh, creating it per se, externally. Let's try to link it with the, your overall performance. And so, so let's take one aspect to it, which is in order to increase your productivity, you should be more focused and you should have less distractions in your life. So let's take distraction uh, for an example. Why do we get distracted so much? And with the advancement of technology today, you have so many things to get involved in your mobile phone is like the biggest enemy. I mean, I really looked at my usage of mobile phone and it has never been less than three hours. And I'm, I was wondering, you know, three hours is a long time to be on mobile phone, right? And mobile is a kind of big distractor. You're doing something and it beeps and then you look at it. So what is happening when I'm distracted? Is this something to do with these hormones? Sure. Well, this has a, been a big topic lately. And I think a lot of people are... Um reproducing the alarmism that they hear in the news. And that's why I, I avoid the news because it's full of uh, blame and alarmism. So if you look at your phone as a substitute for your calendar and a book you might read and the newspaper you might have held in your hand in the past. So it's not really necessarily that you're doing more of something bad because in the past, if you were all the time you spent on your calendar, all the time you spent with a book or newspaper, all the time maybe you spent on the phone with friends and now you're writing them messages instead. So it's not necessarily a bigger intrusion, but let's get into distraction. So there's good distraction and bad distraction. And um, distraction is so popular because it works. So it, it has a function. So let's understand what it is. So our brain is constantly looking for rewards and threats. And it's looking harder for threats because they can hurt you faster. So like, let's say you're at work and you're deciding, how should I spend my time for the next 15 minutes? What task will I do next? So you want to do something that might bring a reward in the future, but you also want to do something that will avoid a threat. So your brain thinks, oh, this threat. Sorry, so you're saying looking for threat or avoiding threat? Well, your brain is looking for possible threats that might happen so that you can avoid them. So you're thinking, maybe my boss will be angry at me if I don't do this. Or um, maybe my colleague will be angry at me if I do that. Okay, or right. maybe my professional association will have a bad reaction if I do that. Mm. So we're always worried about those possible threats. So when I'm deciding what task to do next and how to invest my time, I can think of a lot of bad things that could go wrong with every possible option. And once I think about those bad things, that triggers cortisol. It's a real physical chemical. Why is it triggered? Because of my individual past experience that something went wrong in my past and cortisol was triggered and neurons connected that makes it easy for me to anticipate that same thing going wrong today. So it's very individual. Your thing going wrong is different from mine. So I always notice it with my husband, for example. So um, one person may feel like somebody is judging them and no matter what they do, they're gonna be criticized and they anticipate all these criticisms. So they do nothing. Another person, anticipates getting ignored. That's more my thing, I think. Well, if I do this, I'll get ignored, but if I do that, I'll get ignored. So why should I do that? It's just gonna be ignored. So once you trigger cortisol, that tells your brain to look for threat. It's like once a gazelle smells a predator, then it looks for where is the predator? So that's what people often do at work. Once you anticipate something going wrong, you look for more evidence of things going wrong and that triggers more cortisol. So now you're in a bad loop. And how can you get out of the bad loop? Because you don't wanna work when you're in a bad loop because everything you can do, you can only think of ways that it goes wrong. Mm. So how do you get out of a bad loop? You do whatever got you out of a bad loop in your past. 
especially in your teen years, because that's when we built the biggest circuits in our brain, because that's when neuroplasticity was high. So everyone tends to default to whatever got you out of a bad mood when you were young. So for some people, it's food. For some people, it's alcohol. For some people, it's a video game. For some people, it's calling a friend. So for some people, it's that hobby. For some people, it's politics. So distraction is the reliable way to feel good that you have learned from real experience. So it's a real physical pathway in your brain. And it really works because once you go to your distraction, you stop that whole negative thought loop. How do I avoid it? How do you avoid it? <laughs> so the first step is to know that it's a real physical pathway in your brain that you're doing because it works. Mm -hmm. And then the solution is to build a new pathway. So to say, I created this distraction because I'm feeling bad about moving ahead. And so distraction is a way to erase the bad feeling I had about moving ahead, but I'm not actually moving ahead. <laughs> So how can I feel good about moving ahead? That's always our challenge. So how can I be, feel good about moving ahead? And I do that the way you would do if you were training a dog. So how could you train a dog to do a triple flip? You can't tell the dog, do a triple flip and I'll give you a big reward because the dog's brain doesn't know what a triple flip is. Yeah. So you break it down into tiny pieces and you give the dog a treat every time it moves in one direction. And if it keeps doing that, it does a triple flip. So then when you want to get yourself to move forward, you break your new challenge into very small steps and give yourself a reward for each step. And that will build a new pathway because you will expect a reward. The reward will trigger dopamine and you'll connect neurons and build a pathway. So you literally expect to feel good when you move forward on this new project because you have a dopamine pathway and you stimulate dopamine, just like the monkey, every step toward the banana triggers dopamine. Or if a person is training for a marathon, they are training because they expect a big reward when they run the marathon. So this is the modern motivation system. When a child goes to school, instead of saying you have to do your homework, otherwise you're going to flunk out of school, they say you have to do your homework because you're going to be a superstar. The problem with that is that you soon realize that you're not really on the path to being a superstar. So now you stop doing it. So that's the problem with unrealistic expectations. And we have to learn to motivate ourselves with shorter term rewards for shorter term actions. Isn't it related to neuro-linguistic programming, right? Breaking your old neural pathways and creating new ones? Yes, yes, it, it is. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm not even familiar with that part of neuro-linguistic programming because a lot of people say that, but it is um, related to neuro-linguistic programming, which helps you first to become aware of your old pathways and to become aware of your power to build new pathways. But neuro-linguistic uh, programming does not focus on the dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin piece of it. Mm -hmm. The other part of like procrastination, when I talk about anticipation of rewards, is this um, you want to, you, you get excited when you anticipate oxytocin and serotonin. But if you've had oxytocin and serotonin disappointments in the past, then you think, why bother? Why should I do this? Because I'm not going to get the reward. And that's when you go into the distraction instead. Why would oxytocin and uh, will go wrong? Um, so oxytocin is acceptance and belonging. So many people think if I work hard at this task, then I will become one of the mm -hmm. people that I, let's say, admire. But deep down inside, you think that even if I do this task, those people I admire will not accept me. So right. why should I do it? And that whole thought loop is wired in your teen years. And I'm not blaming those people for not accepting you. I'm more criticizing that belief that you need those people to accept you to be happy. 
but that's the teen view of oxytocin. And it's the same with serotonin is, I will be a star if I do this task. But then you realize, oh, I've done this task five times already and I'm not a star. So I'm not very motivated to continue doing it. What about the things that you are trying for the first time, but you're still procrastinating on them, thinking that, I don't know how tough or difficult it is going to be. So it's not like you've, you've not experienced it. So it doesn't lie into that category that you just mentioned. Why do we procrastinate then? Very good. So we could call that fear of failure. Okay. So fear of failure, it's, it's sort of individual, like, my fear of failure was wired in my early years and your fear of failure was wired in your early years for specific, like if you could, and if I could like remember that those early experiences of fear of failure, it helps you review them with your adult power rather than continually re-experiencing them as a powerless child. So sometimes your fear of failure is because of harsh criticism that you're anticipating, but in other cases, your fear of failure is because you make the steps too big and you have to make them smaller. And sometimes it's because you have unrealistic expectations. Like you think that you should have crowds cheering you and applauding all the time and you can't get yourself to work without them. I, I could yeah. give you another um, oh, interesting example. There's this good book called The Talent Code. Okay. Um, so a lot of people confuse, like they think talent is what matters. And this book explains that talent is learned. And it explains this school for young people who are getting intensive education in like a young kid who's being trained to be a super athlete or a super musician. And they get like hours a day of training in that one skill and then only like a little bit of high school. And it explains something they do. If I make a mistake, like I'm playing the piano or I'm doing tennis and I make a mistake, how they address it is I, instead of starting this musical piece from the beginning, I keep playing the part where I've made the mistake and I just do it slower. And if I do it slower and slower and so that I'm just doing that part where I make the mistake so many times until it becomes automatic and easy, which is building a new pathway. So this is uh, uh, like I talked about unrealistic expectations. So let's say a person who thinks, oh, I can learn a new programming language in a week and then they don't learn it in a week. So then they feel like a failure. So maybe if you think, well, I could learn lesson one in a week and then you would feel like a success. So it's about having an expectation that you could meet because that releases the positive chemical that builds the positive pathway. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. And and you explained very well about the about the science of destruction. Now I'm wondering when I'm doing intense work, kind of focusing, sometimes I am not able to focus. There is nothing distracting me, but still I'm not able to focus. What's okay. Happening? So I don't know what your expectations are about. Um, some people think they should be able to work for five hours in a row and have full focus. And that's just not realistic. So a simple answer is, do you need to take a break? You know, have you been working too long? That's one issue. A separate issue is what, um, when I'm writing. So I love to write, but sometimes I'm too close to what I'm writing and I have to stop and put it away so that I could go back to it and read it without having it already in my circuits. So then I could read it more the way my reader would see it. So when you're too close to something, you just have no perspective on it. So um, the, the subject, if you ever read any books in cognitive psychology, if you ever want to just look at a like an introductory textbook on cognitive psychology, it helps you understand like when you are, at, there's this new fad now, it's called deep work. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at telling you, like you can only do deep work for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And then you should take a break. <laughs> Which works, doesn't it? Where the Pomodoro technique is about, you know, take to work 25 minutes and take break exactly. five minutes. Exactly, exactly. And, and part of that, though, here's the thing. What do you do on your break? 
if you use your break to do something stressful, then it's not really a break. Mm. So <clears throat> if you use your break to call this person and you owe them a phone call, but you really don't like them, that's <laughs> that may not count as a break. You have to do something you like during the break. If you watch the news and you get upset about the state of the world, that's not a break. If you so so that's why and you know what if you have coffee but you've already had three cups of coffee that's not a break so my you may have heard me say this i say this in all my podcasts i think comedy is a break but if you want it to be a break you have to have the comedy ready because sometimes i look at a long list of comedy and i don't like anything until the 10th one so sometimes at night when i have free time and i'm too tired to do anything else I create my, I fill my pantry with nourishing breaks. It's like filling your pantry with nourishing snacks so that then when you need a five minute break, you have that comedy ready. I have to admit, and I have to confess here, I use Pomodoro technique quite a lot. And my focus time is 25 minutes always, but my breaks are always more than five minutes. I, I, that's fine. I think, yeah, yeah, that's good. I, because I think that's of these fine. reasons that you just mentioned, you know, uh, Sometimes I don't even know what exactly is a break because I feel like calling somebody in that break and oh. that call goes longer. So oh, it's... I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Well, here, let's look at it this way. Mm. You have oxytocin goals and serotonin goals and dopamine goals. So if you put all of your energy into your dopamine goal, then your brain is saying, hey, wait a minute that's a waste of my energy because I've already met my dopamine goal. So now I need to put more energy into my oxytocin goal, which is calling that friend and building that reciprocal support network, which mm -hmm. has as much survival value as the resource goals that is your dopamine uh, objective. No, but this was very interesting. I never thought about it as a you know, dopamine goal. And these are, these are the different aspects, areas of life. And if you're I don't know how will you make it work that you can kind of get rid of all your dopamine goals, not dopamine, oxytocin goals. So don't talk to anybody for the whole day and just focus on to what you've been doing. Is it even possible? I mean, there are a lot of people who do that. So it's like a different people have different goals for these hormones, isn't it? Yeah, different people have different expectations. So frankly, when I think of calling a person, mm. I mostly think about how this person is going to get on my nerves and I would rather put, put it off calling them and spend more time writing. So I have to pressure myself to call them. I, I feel like calling them is a distraction from writing, which I'd rather be doing. So we're all wired by our past experience. And that's why we're all challenged to keep saying, okay, what, what is going to be rewarding? What is the best use of my time? And how are, is that decision biased by my early experience? And maybe I need to update that. And I should explain why early experience is such a bias. There's a chemical called myelin, which is the insulation on your neurons that makes your neurons 100% more efficient in conducting energy, uh, electricity. So anything you do with your myelinated neural pathways is so effortless that it comes to you instantly. It's like the difference between speaking your native language and trying to speak a language that you learn in adulthood. So this is why we default to the emotional pathways we learned in our youth, because our youth is when we have a lot of myelin. And that's why we're always challenged to update them and make new decisions about what's the best place to invest our energy. Is the myelin, I don't know, it might not be related, but is the myelin is to do with the alpha, beta, and theta brainwave states? Because he said that children have more myelin, and I've heard and read that children are always in alpha or theta brainwave state, so they learn oh. everything and it remains forever. Is it something linked? Oh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Um, but uh, I think the other brain states that children don't have is that they're learned. And anything you learn in childhood gets myelinated. So the states that you uh, spent more time in in childhood, they just come more easily to you. So mm. you're always facing the choice, do I want to just go where I flow effortlessly and repeat myself? 
Or do I want the challenge of building a new pathway, which might not be so rewarding in the long run, but is more, I mean, in the short run, but is more rewarding in the long run. And there's no right answer. I got a, a beautiful explanation of this in the book Flow. It said, like, if I'm in a bad mood and I listen to a piece of music and I feel better, but if I listen to that piece of music every minute of every day, then that music will not, will not, it won't absorb my my attention anymore. So um, what do I do? Well, it said, if you expose yourself to a new piece of music, what absorbs your circuits mm -hmm. is music that's familiar, but not too familiar. So how can you get that? By investing in something new. Yeah. And in the beginning, it's not rewarding so that it's in the middle ground then it's rewarding, but you know that in the long run, it's not going to be rewarding forever. You're going to get tired of it. Like if I discover a new food. So we're always having to decide, do I want to put in the effort to discover something new, which is not really fun right now mm. or not? And I think uh, I've had uh, Stephen Kotler, I'll put the link here on, on the show, who talks about Flow. He has a company called Flow Research Collective. And I remember speaking to him and talking about novelty, how important it is to have some newness in order to achieve your flow state. Thank you. Yes, I, I forgot. That's what I was going to say. So um, the reason novelty like that has a bad image, right? Oh, you always want something new or novel. Mm -hmm. So to understand why it's a real physical response in in the world of nature, if I find a tree full of fruit, and that meets my needs. It's a huge reward. And I'm so excited because I'm getting all those calories at once. But that fruit does not meet all of my needs because I still need protein and water and firewood. So if I got pleasure from that one fruit tree forever, my other needs would not be met. So that's why we stop enjoying something as soon as the need is met. Mm. And then we have to meet another need in order to, to feel good. So that's why it's valuable to um, diversify our energy rather than just focusing on one thing. Mm, interesting. Okay, Loretta, not directly linked, but there are a few things that I read in uh, one of the book because I read both the books in uh, within last one week. Um, so I forgot to mention which book it was. But what good talking. focus you have. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned about uh, internal conflicts and external conflicts. And, uh, you know, how do you find your internal power instead of blaming the six situations or circumstances or i i kind of noted down this and i forgot the context apologies but i really wanted to talk to you about this because it's a big problem and it applies everywhere in your normal life uh, situations you you want to blame you want to blame even for me not being able to focus, I will blame on, uh, on the technology, for example, right? So if I am not able to do something, I will find something to blame on, right? Is there a science behind? Why do I feel good when I blame something on somebody or something or some circumstances or anything really? Well, thank you for asking that. This is my new uh, focus because I think it's, it's so um, critical that, um, young people have been taught you know you're you're young compared to me so the, the the new fad in academic psychology is to teach people to always blame something external so yeah. if you i i saw this when i was raising my children that if you eat this hamburger it's the fault of the company that made the hamburger for teaching you that so so the science is that our brain gets wired from experience so if you have people constantly telling you it's not your fault it's their fault that you did this then it raises your status because this is the serotonin part we all want status nobody wants to admit that they want status but as soon as all of your other needs needs are met you put all of your energy into the quest for status now when i fail to achieve something I want to achieve, whether it's my physical appearance or my financial status or my social status. Uh, when I fail to achieve it, I feel bad. I feel one down. I don't get the serotonin. So if I blame someone else, then I feel a little bit better. 
And then it creates a sense of social bonding is I find other people who blame that same thing that I'm blaming. And then we all join together and we raise our status forever. For uh, We raise our status together by saying, yeah, we're all good and they're all bad. They're, our problems are their fault. And so we have that sense of social strength. Uh, so that feels good in the in the short run. So it's like an addiction because an addiction is something that feels good in the short run, but hurts you in the long run. Very interesting. Okay. I I was always thinking, uh, you know, when, when you mentioned about serotonin, right? So when you blame somebody, you feel better and it's not my fault, right? So I'm good. And that makes I'm you good. Feel so much good. So much feel uh, that makes you feel so much better then you create some neural pathways that in order to feel better you need to blame somebody right whatever is the situation and then we make it so permanent that it is so difficult even if you know deep down that it's your fault whatever it was you still try to find some reasons yes exactly and when you said i feel good let's talk about that so um I feel like I'm a good person if I do X, Y, and Z, however this person is wired. So right. maybe you feel like you're a bad person if you get distracted, but then you feel good again if you blame your distraction on them. Maybe you feel bad if you eat a hamburger, but you feel good again if you blame your eating the hamburger. Maybe you feel bad if you don't save money, but then you feel good again if you blame your spending problem on them. So the urge to feel good, let's talk about that. So in the modern world, this um, virtue is the this moral superiority is the alternative to financial status. It's like having this, I'm a morally superior person. So having a bigger car is bad, flashing money is bad, but letting everybody know how morally superior you are um, is good. And of course, there's value in learning this self-restraint. It's good to restrain your animal impulse to eat all the food in front of you or spend all the money that you can access in this moment. So we all need to learn self-restraint and it's hard to learn self-restraint. So that's why, how do I feel better when my self-restraint lapses? So it's better to understand the physiology of self-restraint. And that's in those books by um, Ray Baumeister, um, what, what he calls it ego depletion. He says that self-restraint actually requires a lot of glucose in the brain and, um, and also sleep uh, energy. It requires a lot of energy to restrain yourself. So if you're not getting enough sleep, that's bad. Now, the other, if you're hungry, you're not going to have enough glucose to restrain yourself. That's why you overeat when you're hungry. That's really interesting. And I'm like, I'm loving this conversation. I wanted to, you know, ask a lot of questions about happiness and stuff. But only in the interest of time, I would ask you one common question that I ask almost all my guests, which is uh, what according to you are the top three skills or behaviors that one needs in order to live a fulfilled life that schools are not teaching? Great question. And that just happens to be the, the conclusion of all of my books. We could say is one skill for getting more dopamine, one skill for getting more oxytocin, and one skill for getting more serotonin. So the dopamine skill, we already talked about breaking things into small bits, but let's talk about giving yourself a short run, uh, a short run goal, a long run goal, and a middle term goal. So that as long as you're moving toward any of them, your brain is going to release dopamine. And some of them will be blocked all the time because you can't always make progress. So if you have multiple goals, then you can always shift between one and another. So you could always stimulate that good feeling of mo moving forward. And what I always say is, um, I have a mess in my desk drawer and that's an example of a short run goal that I can have control over. So it's very frustrating to look at the mess in my drawer and I'm probably never gonna do anything about it. But if I make a goal of like one quarter, let's say what would be one quarter of this and I'm gonna turn on my Pomodoro and give myself 10 minutes to work on this one quarter of my desk drawer, it feels so good when you're done. You get the dopamine and it builds that feeling of I can set a goal and achieve it and it will feel good when I'm done. So. 
this uh, is powerful. I have to interrupt you because, uh, and then we, uh, maybe I will ask you the second and third, but I just wanted to add something. You've written in somewhere in the book that uh, the goals don't bring satisfaction. And now I can realize why it is important to have midterm and short-term goals when you have like, you can have a big year long goal, but if you don't have smaller pieces, then you're unlikely to achieve them. And the reason is that every time you achieve a short-term goal, you have that dopamine rush, right? Yes, okay. yes. And when you when the goal is far away, you don't perceive yourself getting closer and you only right. get the dopamine if you actually perceive yourself getting closer. That's what mm -hmm. stimulates it. Okay. So um, oxytocin goal. So this is complicated because our brain naturally wants protection from others, but I can't control what other people do. So I have to do something that I can control. So let's say I can offer something to you but if I offer to buy you a new car, then I'm likely to be disappointed. So that would be stupid. So if I do something very small for you, and then tomorrow I do something very small for somebody else, and every day I do something very small for a different person, then in my brain, I will be building my side of the bridge toward a lot of people. And then one day, one person will reciprocate and another day, another person will reciprocate. So that will trigger the expectation of a reward and the expectation that I have some control. I can do something about building this web of social alliances. And um, this was the famous thing at Harvard Business School that you might know. They called it the value of weak bonds. Mm -hmm. That what you, you know, the study where no, I'm, I'm liking whatever you're saying so far. Okay. Go on, tell me. You may think that somebody got ahead because their cousin is the president of the world. But in fact, what helps you is having many weak bonds with a lot of people rather than the strong bonds with just a few people. And the way you build weak bonds is you offer to do something for someone. And you don't offer in a manipulative way that tries to control them. And you don't offer in a burdensome way that makes you angry, but you just offer something small that's easy for you and you diversify it. I love this concept of having many weak bonds versus one strong. It, it puts you into, it's like, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yes, exactly. I didn't, I didn't know that it applies to relationships also. In exactly. some good sense, of course. Exactly. And it also yeah. makes a better marriage because if you're not expecting one person to meet all your needs, then you don't get angry at them when they fail to meet your needs. Okay. What's the third one? So serotonin, again, very difficult. So I want respect from others, but I can't control them. I can't force them to respect me. So what can I do? So what I explain is you could put yourself up without putting others down. Mm. So I can feel the reality is that I would rather get recognition from others than to get recognition, to, than to give myself recognition, but other people will not give me recognition until I do something. If I need the recognition in advance, then I'm, I'm not gonna get it and then I'm never gonna do anything worth recognizing. So, my hobby is I read a lot of biographies and I've learned that most people that you would respect, they didn't get recognition until after they died or in some cases, decades after they did the thing that they're recognized for. Mm. So you have to be able to sort of fuel your own action by having confidence and giving yourself the applause rather than to expect the world to applause you all, to, all the time. Uh, I just made, I said applause you, I realized, but that sounds actually realistic to the way people think. Um, but the bottom line is, if I'm applauding myself all the time for no reason, the way they're like now teaching little kids in school, that they're a superstar, no matter how bad they do. Oh, you're, you're a superstar, go, hooray. That's not very realistic. So many people, they put themselves up by putting others down, like, I'm stupid, but you're stupider. Mm -hmm. And that's not very good. So it's like, how can I put myself up without putting others down? 
Awesome, I would say outstanding. This is like one of the very different sort of answer I've got uh, to this question. Thank you very much. With the scientific evidence <laughs> onto how you can, I mean, anybody can use these skills, right? Okay, Loretta, finally, tell us how people can reach you. Sure. Um, I have a website called innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. I have a new course that I'm offering, a video course with um, uh, it, a lot of step-by-step um, uh, -step exercises that help you design and build the new pathways to your happy chemicals that you want. I also have a lot of free resources and information about my books, podcasts, and free videos and infographics. So you'll find everything there also for parenting and addiction. I have a career page. So anything, any way that you like to learn, I have it there. Awesome. Thank you. I will put all of those links down in the description so that people can click on and click and go to your website. Thank you very much. I would request all of the viewers, if you found this conversation interesting, I would highly recommend you go and check her work. I will put all her links of her website or LinkedIn profile and everything of the books, etc. down here. Do check it. It'll give you a different perspective on how to, how to know yourself, really, how to know your personal behaviors. And then Loretta gives you example with the wildlife, you know, how, how do monkeys or ancestors or monkeys, you know, right? <laughs> how did they behave? And not just, and, and, uh, not just monkeys, reptiles and reptiles are like really, like, I think are the first known ancestors were fishes, I believe. So her work has got everything. She has, she has literally researched a lot. And I, I read in her profile also that she's gone to zoo or some wildlife experience she's had. Um, she's nodding her head. You can't see it. <laughs> But yes, it's really profound. Please do check out our work. And if you've got some value from this interview, then do not forget to hit the subscribe button. And then Loretta, thank you very much for being here and sharing your wisdom. I really, really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks a lot. Guys, I'll see you again next week. Until then, you take care and keep learning.